Okay, so yesterday we um, started looking at polar coordinates. Okay, we saw basically it's much more convenient if you have to draw things that are circular or graph things that use a radius and an angle. That's polar. Okay, that's what we use it for. Right, and the last thing we did was we converted from polar to rectangular. We had two formulas, x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. Okay. Well, now today we're going to start by converting the other way. We're going to take something that's in rectangular and change it to polar. Okay, Mariah, what are the two, um, two letters we usually use when you graph in rectangular? Yep, we have an x and a y. And if we're changing that to polar, we have to find two different letters. Um, Katie, what are, what are the letters we use in polar? Theta. Okay. Yep. T H E T A. Theta. All right. So our goal is to find these two things. You're going to be given those two things. All right. So let's see if we can sketch it. And like we usually do in trig, what um, what shape do you think I'm going to draw here? What's it? Yeah, we're going to make a triangle. Okay. The side is X. This side is y. Let me um, make a different color. And I'm going to draw in the hypotenuse. Okay, so there's our, there's our triangle. You're going to know two of the sides. You know the length of the bottom. And you're going to know the height. That's how far right do you go and how far up do you go. Okay, where would R be in that triangle? The distance from the center to that point. It would represent what, what side in that triangle? X. Um, not X. X is good. We're going to know X. They're going to tell you how far over to go and then how far up or down to go. But, Jen? The hypotenuse. It's the hypotenuse. If you can find the hypotenuse, you can find R. Okay, so we'll talk about how to find that in a second. And this is your angle. Your angle is always between the hypotenuse and the positive x-axis. All right, let's start with, um, with r. If you know x and y, how could you get r? What could you use? Yeah? The Pythagorean theorem. Yeah, the Pythagorean theorem. x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Okay, so that's one formula you need. Next thing we want to do is find theta. Okay, Like I've done before, I'm going to circle the things you know, I'm going to circle the thing you want to know, and we're going to figure out which trig function we could use. That's what we want to know. And those are the two things we will know. Okay, So first thing I want to try to figure out is the name of these two sides I circled relative to that angle. Okay, Zach, what's the name of the side that's... Um, farthest away that we have labeled as y. No, adjacent means next to. Opposite. Okay, opposite is the one that's furthest away. So in this case, y is opposite. x is adjacent. I'll give you one more shot. Do you know what trig function has those two in it? Opposite and adjacent. Uh, no, not cosine. Cosine has hypotenuse in it. Tangent. Okay, so we're going to use tangent to find theta. Okay. So the tangent of theta equals opposite over adjacent. Now, our last step we want to do is get uh, rid of tangent, get theta by itself. All right, so Chris, uh, how would you get rid of tangent? Yeah, we're going to take the inverse tangent of each side. So do it on the left. Okay, do it on the right. And you get a formula, theta equals inverse tangent of y over x. Okay, 
question on that? Does anybody remember we, we talked about all the inverse trig functions and what the answers were between? So like when you type this in on a calculator, you're always going to get an answer between two numbers. Okay, for inverse cosine, it was 0 to 180. Does anyone remember what it was for inverse tangent? It was negative something to positive something. Um, so if you're thinking of something else, this, this function does go up and down forever. So kind of on the right track. Um, but I'm thinking of something, two numbers. It's negative this number to positive this number. Not negative one to one. That's, that's it for the sine function. That's how high and low it goes. Negative 90 to positive 90. Okay. This is negative 90. This is positive 90. So in other words, you're always going to get an answer that's somewhere in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. This formula wouldn't allow you to get an answer in quadrants two and three. And it's possible you, you should be able to get answers in those quadrants. All right? So we're going to have to make an adjustment to this formula if it's going to work in quadrants two and three. The way it is right now, it'll work perfect in quadrants one and four. Okay. But we'll fix it for two and three. So first thing you have to do is you have to graph your point. Because depending on which quadrant you're in, that's going to change the formula you use to find the angle. Okay, for quadrants one and four, use that formula we just came up with on the other page. Works perfect. And that's what it's designed for. Inverse tangent will always give you an answer between negative 90 and 90. Quadrants four and one. But if we want to get answers in the other two quadrants, what we're going to have to do is put plus pi or plus 180. Depends if you're working in degrees or radians. Okay, so if you're in quadrants 2 or 3, put a plus 180 or plus pi in front of the formula. Okay, so it's very important you understand where your point is before you convert it. Just to make sure everybody knows the quadrants, those are your quadrants. So using those formulas, that'll give you your angle for theta if it's in a quadrant. Where else could your angle be besides being in one of the quadrants? Could be on something. Origin. Uh, it's always going to be somewhere off, off the origin, our point. Unless the radius was zero. Then, remember what I said yesterday, if the radius is zero, it's like you're spinning it's like you're spinning your pencil in place. It doesn't move. So the angle wouldn't matter at that point. OK, but that's, that is important too. Yeah? It could be on an axis. OK, and if you're on an axis, we don't want to use these formulas. Okay. For example, let's say you were on the y-axis. I don't care about the y value, but what would the x value be for any point on the y axis? Zero. It would be zero. If you're on the y axis, you have not gone left or right. You've only gone up or down. Well, if the x value is zero, are you allowed to divide by zero in a fraction? No. Okay. So that's where you'd run into a problem using these formulas on an axis. Okay, so if you're on an axis, that's a special case. You have four choices what your answer would be. It's one of these four. Okay, how do you figure it out? Well, just sketch it. If you go to the right, that's 0. If you go up, okay, that's 90. If you go left, that's 180. And if you went down, that's 0. That's 270. Okay, so if you're on an axis, you have one of those angles, that'll be your answer. 
that covers all the different places the angle could be in a quadrant on an axis. Okay, last thing you have to do is find r, which we already said. Use the Pythagorean theorem. This formula works for every quadrant. Okay, you don't you don't need a different formula depending on the quadrant. That's only for theta. Some people like to find r first. That's fine. If you want to, you got to find the r and you got to find theta. You got to find both. Whichever one you want to do first, it's up to you. Okay. Any questions on the two formulas to find theta or that formula? For the 180, do you, do you do that much lower? So you, you do the inverse tangent of y over x first. Take that answer and hit plus 180. Or plus pi. Yeah. Let's say pi right next to it. Plus plus. Right here? Plus. OK, any, um, any other questions on that? Can you scroll back up to number one? For quadrants one and four? No, like the first step. Oh, step one is just determine theta. Oh, step two, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. Step one is graph the point. And by graph it, I don't, I'm not looking for anything super accurate here, not like we did yesterday. I just want you to figure out which quadrant you're in. Some people can just do that in their head, and that's fine. Okay, any, um, any other questions? All right, so let's try... Um, Changing a couple points that are in rectangular to polar. All right, so our first one is the point 2, negative 2. First thing I'll figure out is my quadrant. Um, Damiano, what quadrant am I going to be in? Four. Yeah, I'm going to be quadrant 4. Right 2, down 2. So can you tell me, Damiano, what's my formula to get the angle if I'm in the fourth quadrant? Well, what's that function we use again? Um, inverse tangent. Good. Inverse uh, tangent. Of, what did you say? Uh, y over x. Okay. Remember, first number is x, second number is y. So we have the inverse tangent of negative 2 over 2. Okay, when I type that in, if I don't want to deal with the fraction, I could just simplify that because it's easy enough. What's negative 2 divided by 2? Negative, negative 1. Negative 1. So let's find the inverse tangent of negative 1. Okay, and let's do it in degrees. Okay, on the test, it'll tell you if they're looking for degrees or radians. that in and we get negative 45. Hey, so that's half, half of what we need. We've got our angle. Okay, Carlos, um, besides the angle, what else do I need? R. Yep, I need R. Okay. What's my formula to get R? X squared plus Y squared. X squared plus Y squared. What's that equal? Yeah, R squared. Okay, so fill it in. And let's square it as we go. So we fill in 2 squared is 4. Plus, be careful here, negative 2 squared is how much? It's 4 again. So we get 8 equals R squared. Okay, so Christine, uh, how would I get rid of that exponent? square root. And last thing I'll do is reduce the square root of 8. Um, how does that simplify? Two square roots of 2. Okay, we did that back when we did unit circle trig and distance formula. Anytime we work with a square root, always reduce it if you can. Any question on how he did that? Then that's it. Now we just write our final answer. 
So it's par, comma, theta. Right, so to write two negative two in polar, that's how you do it. Okay, any question on that? So notice this time we didn't have to add 180 to the angle because we were in quadrant four. We didn't have to add 180 to the angle because we were in quadrant four. So we use this formula. If we're in quadrant two or three, we're going to have to do plus 180. Okay, negative four, negative five. Okay, Catherine, what, um, which quadrant is that going to be in? That's in quadrant three. Left four, down five. Okay, again, not looking for it to be exact. I'm going to assume everybody knows how to graph rectangular coordinates. Um, but I just want to know the quadrant. OK, so Rosa, what is my formula for theta in the third quadrant? Um, pi plus inverse tangent y over x. OK, and because you said pi instead of 180, what units are we using? Uh, We're using radians now, which is fine. I'll do this problem in radians. Okay, if she had said 180, I would have done this problem in degrees. Okay. All right, so because we're using pi, it doesn't change how I set anything up. Fill it in. So it's pi plus inverse tangent of negative 5 over negative 4. Do I need to type the negatives in when I do inverse tangent? No, because how, why is the reason? Doing the opposite. Right, when you divide a negative by a negative, they cancel out and become a positive. Right, so there's no reason to, to type them in. In fact, cancel them out right now. I find the less I have to type in, the less mistakes I usually make. Okay, so negative, negative cancels, so 5 fourths. And this time we're doing it in radians. So we get 0.896. Last step, add pi to that. So it's 4.038. That's your angle. Okay, radians. All right, regardless of whether you use radians or degrees, that has no effect on finding r. r is not an angle, r is a length. So we'll find it just like we did last time. Um, Danielle, what's my formula again to find R? Um, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. Yep, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. OK, don't make the mistake when you do this and square a negative and write a negative. Anytime you square a negative, it's always a positive. So negative 4 squared is 16, negative 5 squared is 25. Add them up. You get 41. Take the square root. And that's R. Okay, this time there is, um, there's no way to reduce the square root of 41. Okay, they might ask you for a decimal. Okay, so let's write, let's just write it. Um, using square root 41. So there's my radius and my angle. Do you need to put the words RAD on the angle? No. Nope. You just don't want to put a degree symbol on this one. Any question how to change the uh, square root to a decimal if I ask you to do that on a calculator? So 
So any question on converting to polar? All right. So now with polar, what you should be able to do um, is you should be able to change polar to rectangular, rectangular to polar, and you should be able to graph, if I give you a polar grid, any, any point that I give you. Okay. All right. So that finishes up um, 5.1. All right. So the last thing we're going to do is look at section A.4, part one, okay, which is on complex numbers. But before we look at it, I just want to kind of draw out um, a diagram of our number system just to kind of see where, where do complex numbers fit into like the bigger picture. All right, so when you start out learning about numbers, okay, the simplest kind of numbers that you use start at one, they don't even include zero, and they go up, not using fractions or decimals. Anybody know what kind of numbers those are? They start at one, and they just go two, three, four, five, six, no fractions or decimals. Whole numbers? Actually, whole numbers, we're going to get to those in one second. That's going to include zero. It's a different name if it doesn't include zero. Think about what are you doing when you go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What am I doing with the people in this room right now? Counting them. Okay, so those are your counting numbers. Okay, simplest kind of numbers you can have. Counting. Okay, and if all we did was limit ourselves to using counting numbers, there's a lot of types of calculations you wouldn't be able to do. For example, somebody give me a counting number. Any, any counting number you want. Seven? I'm going to do subtraction with that. I'm going to take away seven. Is the answer that you're going to get here a counting number? No. So if all you understand is counting numbers, and to you nothing else exists, you'd say you can't do that. You'd say, well, if you try to do 7 minus 7, you get something that's not a counting number. I don't know about anything else other than counting numbers. So that's where they come with the next set. Those are the whole numbers. And whole numbers now include 0, okay, the idea of having nothing. If all you're doing is counting things, why would you ever need the number zero? If there was zero of something to count, you wouldn't be counting it anyway. Right? But a lot of people started to do other things besides just simple counting. All right? Now, if I add two whole numbers together, the answer that I get will always be a whole number. Pick any whole number, add any other whole number, and you'll be fine. How about if I subtract? If I subtract two whole numbers, will the answer always come out to a whole number? What, what could I get? I could get a negative. So if I did 5, take away 12. If all you understand is whole numbers, you'd say that's impossible. How can you take away more than you have? You can't do that. Well, the only way we can do that is if we're going to introduce another new kind of number, okay? negative numbers. And that's where the integers come in. All right. So the only reason for inventing integers is so that we have negative numbers. So you can actually do a subtraction problem where you have a smaller number minus a bigger number. Okay. And there's a lot of practical uses for that. If you have $5,000 and it's going to cost you $12,000 to buy, some, buy a car, well, you're going to have to borrow. Borrow means debt or negative. So now that we have integers, if you add integers together, you're fine. If you subtract them, you're fine. If you multiply them, you're fine. What kind of problem could I still run into if all I understand is integers? When I divide. Anybody give me a division problem that if all you understand is integers wouldn't make sense? Five divided by three. Five divided by three. Perfect. 
if you look at this from a very like physical object standpoint, take five objects and divide them between three people. You can't do that. You can't take five of something. What's that? Two. You throw two of them away. Yeah, throw two of them away, then you can do it. Or get one more. But if you've got five things, you can't split them equally between three people unless you're going to allow fractions or parts of things, okay, decimals. So that gets us to our next number set. Anybody know the name of the number set that includes fractions? It begins with an R. Irrational. Irrational numbers, yep. And up to this point, I, I think the numbers that we have are very practical. You use rational numbers all the time. Hardly ever do you go to the store and buy something and it's exactly $3 or $5. It's like $12.36. That 36 cents is a fraction of a dollar. Okay, it's a decimal um, when you're cooking. Okay, a lot of recipes, you don't need exactly two cups or three cups. Maybe you need two and a half cups or one and a third cups, you know, thing, things like that. Okay, but for most everyday purposes, rational is about as sophisticated as you need to get. Beyond the rational numbers, the uses start to get more theoretical. Okay? Not everyday kind of uses. Some of the uses I don't even think I can explain to you because I don't know them. All right? But our next number set includes kinds of numbers that are not capable of being represented as fractions. Anybody know what you call those numbers? Irrational. You're irrational. Okay, an example would be the square root of 2. The square root of 2 is a number that it never ends, it never repeats. You can never write it as a fraction. I could prove that to you. You cannot write the square root of 2 as a fraction. Uh, pi. Okay, pi is another number that, at least up until now, they haven't proven you can't write it as a fraction, but they've had computers generate hundreds and hundreds of millions and billions of digits of pi, and they haven't found a pattern yet. Okay. So chances are they, they probably won't find a pattern. So pi is a number you can't write as a fraction or decimal. And for most purposes, though, why do you even need to know pi that long? You know, 3.141592653535 and so on. You don't need that, many, that much accuracy, okay. especially um, like on a state test like MCAS. All you need is 3.14. Right. Now, if you're machining parts, maybe you're making like a, a cylinder, and you have a piston inside it for an engine, you're probably more accurate than the hundredth. You might be accurate to the thousandths or the ten thousandths, maybe even a hundred thousandths of an inch. Okay. So you do need a little bit more accuracy, but you certainly don't need 50 decimals worth. Probably not that much. Right. So again, use a little more a little more theoretical, a little bit more abstract away from what we do in real life. Now together, all your rational and irrational numbers make up what we call the real number system. Okay. Everything we've done right here, this is Algebra 1. Okay. Anything you do in that class, these are the kinds of numbers that you study. Anything you do, that's it. And one way you can kind of visualize and, and, and make sense of this, if you view these as places, one inside the other, okay, view counting as like a specific city, okay, like Fitchburg. Okay. Whole is like a state, Massachusetts. Integers, that's the Northeast. Okay, rational is the United States. Reals is Earth. Right? So if I'm in Fitchburg, am I automatically in Massachusetts? Yes. yes. If I'm in Fitchburg, am I automatically in the Northeast? Yeah, Assume, you know, assuming there's not multiple other Fitchburgs. If I'm in Fitchburg, am I automatically on Earth? Yeah. Okay. If you're in one of these boxes on the inside, you're automatically within everything else. Just like if you're in that city, you're automatically in that state and that country. But if you're in the United States, are you automatically in Fitchburg? No. It doesn't work the other way around, right? So if you're a counting number, you're automatically a whole number, you're automatically an integer, you're automatically everything else outside of it. But if you're an integer, 
you're not automatically a whole number. Okay? That'd be like saying if you're in the Northeast, you're automatically in Massachusetts. No, okay, it doesn't work that way. Okay, so any question on that? All right, so now this brings us to the kind of numbers we're going to look at now. Let's say I wanted to figure that problem out, okay, the square root of negative 4. Well, to figure out the answer to a square root, you need two numbers that are the same, so that when you multiply them together, you get a negative. Okay, the two numbers have to be the same. Well, if you multiply a positive and a positive, what kind of number do you get? Positive. Okay. What about if we multiply a negative and a negative? That's a positive. So there's no way with the kind of numbers that we know up till now to multiply two numbers together that are the same and ever get a negative. All right. So if you were in Algebra 1 and I put that on a, on a test, this is what they would write. Undefined. Okay. Just like if you don't understand the number 0, you'd have to say 7 minus 7 is undefined. You don't, you don't know how to represent it, okay? even on the calculator. Okay. Try typing in the square root of negative 4. Okay. Watch what happens. Okay. Calculator says it's an error. Can't do it. Because it says the answer that you get is not a real number. It's something else. All right. So if we decide to upgrade the calculator to Algebra 2. Now it understands another kind of number, which we're going to write down the name of in a second. And now you ask it the same question, it's going to give me an answer. Because okay. now it's saying, OK, I understand more than just the reals. I understand imaginary. OK, the uses for imaginary numbers, uh, they're pretty limited. Most people in their real life would never have to worry about an imaginary number. Okay, I've looked online and it says there's some uses in engineering. Um, is anybody in um, electronics? Or engi I think it's engineering now, engineering tech. Yeah, do you use I or J at all? Mm. Not job, not yet. All right, some students have mentioned to me they use, they call it J, we call it I. But it's the same idea. What the use exactly is in that shop, I don't completely understand. But it's something with electricity. Okay. Um, okay. So for most purposes, we're not going to look at applications of imaginary numbers. We're going to do calculations. Okay. Don't worry about what the, um, what the actual application would be. Uh, maybe in calculus, maybe some really advanced math you could use it. But again, math that's way above what, what I know how to do or actually do in everyday life. Okay, now we take together all the reals and imaginaries, and those are called complex numbers. Okay. Complex numbers are made up of two parts. They have a real part, and they have an imaginary part. Okay. And that's what we'll start with for this section. Generally, the way we write a complex number is you put the real part first. Could be plus or minus, depends if it's positive or negative. Then your imaginary part, and then you put an i. Okay. That's called the standard form of a complex number. There's an example. 2 plus 3i. In this case, the real part is 2. The imaginary part is 3. Okay, you don't say the imaginary part is 3i. Whatever is, whatever is in front of the i, that's the imaginary part, 3. Okay, so any question on that, that form? Always put real part, then imaginary part. Don't write 3i plus 2. It's not that it's wrong, it's just not the standard way we do it. Okay, if a number doesn't have a real part, let's say that part wasn't there, 
all it has is an imaginary part. That's called a pure imaginary number, okay, like 4i. There's no real part to it. Negative 2i, okay, no real part. If you wanted to think of what the real part was here, it's 0. But if it's 0, we usually don't bother writing it. Any questions what a pure imaginary number is? It's a number that does not have a real part. Or you could say the real part is 0. Okay, now technically, every number that you've, you've ever studied is a complex number. Complex number is like the big category. Okay, think of that if you want to think of a place bigger than Earth, uh, solar system. Okay, complex numbers include everything you've ever studied. Okay, even in Algebra 1, okay, if you had a problem like this, and you solve it, divide each side by 2 x equals 5. That's a complex number. It's a complex number that does not have an imaginary part. Okay? The imaginary part is 0. Okay? Anytime you have a 0 for a part, we usually don't bother writing it. We just say the answer here is 5. Okay? You wouldn't normally say 5 plus 0i. Okay, any question on that? Okay, so that's important to understand. Every number you've ever worked with has been a complex number. Okay, is there anything outside of complex numbers, like an even, even bigger category? Uh, not, not that I'm aware of. Okay, every, every number, every class I've ever taken, either in high school or for my bachelor's or master's, they've worked with numbers up to complex numbers. Up to and including complex numbers. Everyone have a second page? Okay. In general, we're going to cover just a real small part of complex numbers. If you really wanted to study complex numbers, it's a whole class. The whole class is complex numbers. It's like in college, it would be like a three, three month long semester class, four months. All right. So. So next thing is, what does it mean for two complex numbers to be equal? Well, we know what that means for real numbers. Okay, but if we had two different complex numbers, okay, say we had a plus bi and c plus di, for those two numbers to be equal, two things have to match. The real parts have to match. Okay, so a would have to match C, and the imaginary parts would have to match. So B would have to match D. That's not something we normally have to do when we talk about real numbers. With real numbers, there's only one part. If I said to you, what number is equal to 5, you just say 5. Okay? There's, not, there's not a second part to that. But with complex numbers, there is, and you can't forget about it. So there's an example of two complex numbers that are equal. 3 plus 8i equals 3 plus 8i. Now, if I did this, those complex numbers are no longer equal. The real parts match, but now the imaginary parts don't. Okay? So those would not be equal. Those are. All right, any question on the idea of what equality means for complex numbers. Okay, we're going to talk more about this i, okay, what, what this really means in a little bit. But for now, just think of it as something that's there that tells you whatever's in front of it is imaginary. Okay, just think of it that way. All right, and two operations we're going to look at today with complex numbers are how you add them 
and subtract them. Okay, we are going to multiply and divide, and you did that in Algebra 2. Um, we'll save that for tomorrow. All right, let's say we want to add these complex numbers up. Okay, the first number has a real part and an imaginary part, and the second number has a real part and an imaginary part. You can only combine certain things. You kind of think of it as combining like terms. What do you think you can combine here? Yeah? A and C. You can combine A and C, because A is real and C is real. And what else do you think you can combine? Yeah? B and D. And B, because it's imaginary, and D, because it's imaginary. So if you want to add these up, you combine the real parts together. A plus C, then combine the imaginary parts, B plus D, and make sure you keep an eye to let people know that that part is imaginary. And that's it. It's really just like combining like terms. In fact, for the purpose of adding, subtracting complex numbers, you can almost pretend like I were a different letter, okay, like it was an X. Like if you were to add 8X and 2X, what would you get? It's going to be the same thing here, except we're not using an X, we're using an I. All right, let's combine the real parts. Okay, Chelsea, if I add up the real parts, okay, what will I get? Eleven. Okay, so the real part is eleven. Uh, and Cassandra, what about the imaginary part? Ten. Yeah. Eight plus two is ten. Make sure you put an eye on it so people know that that's imaginary. Okay, any questions on that? That's how you add complex numbers. Let's try this one. 4 minus 2i plus 3 minus 8i. Okay, so Casey, what do you get um, when you combine your real parts? Seven. Good, 7. 4 plus 3 is 7. And Kitty, if I combine the imaginary parts, what will I get this time? Ten. Uh, be careful. Where is it? Negative two plus eight. It's negative two plus negative eight. Negative ten. Negative ten. And what letter goes next to that? I. I. Yep, so you follow all your same rules for, for arithmetic. Okay, in example 1C, just be careful with all the negatives that you do your, um, do your arithmetic correctly. Okay, Jordan, if I combine negative 3 and then add negative 7, what do I get? Negative 10. Yep, we get negative 10. <coughs> and for the imaginary part, about, yep, how Plus 4. Yeah, it's going to be plus 4. Negative 4 plus 8. That's like 8 minus 4. Okay, so any question on combining um, two complex numbers by adding? Okay, so what I would do on your reference sheet, put down an example of one of each type. Add, subtract, multiply, um, and, div and divide. For some reason, once people learn multiply and divide, it's like they forget how to add and subtract. I, I don't know why. Every year. Adding and subtracting, that's the simple ones. Okay. So put, put one of each type on your reference sheet. All right. Well, with subtracting, uh, the only thing you've got to be careful of is when you subtract, you're <laughs> subtracting a real part and you're subtracting an imaginary part. So you can almost think of this negative as being distributed. 
So when you combine your real parts, it would be A minus C and B minus D. All your rules for arithmetic still apply. So if, if C happens to be a negative and you have A minus a negative number, minus a minus becomes a plus. Try to subtract those. Um, so you've got 4 plus 12i minus 3 plus 4i. Okay, anyone think they can tell me the um, whole answer? Final answer, yep. 1 plus 8i. Yep. 4 minus 3 gives me 1. 12 mi 12i minus 4i gives me 8i. Any question on that? All right. And let's just do one more for subtraction. So 3 minus 5i minus 8 minus 6i. Careful when you do the subtraction. How about um, Brittany? What would you get here? Negative five plus what? Okay, I like the negative five. That's good. But you've got negative five plus 6. Right, it's going to be 1i. Okay, if you have 1i, just like in algebra, if there's a 1, you don't have to put the 1, you just put plus i. Any question on that? All right, so we've talked a lot about, you know, what is, you know, this i thing, okay? We've just been using it to represent the imaginary part. Well, when you're doing complex numbers, okay, I is not a letter. Okay? Or what it represents is not a letter. This is what it represents. It's the square root of negative 1. If you have a calculator that does complex numbers, take the square root of negative 1, and you get I. Okay? Why do you get that? It's a definition. Okay? which means you can't prove why. It's just what it is. Okay. It's kind of like if you asked me in geometry, why do parallel lines never cross? Well, that's the definition of what parallel means. Parallel lines are two lines that never cross. Okay. That's just the way it works. You can't prove that. Okay. So this is like a postulate, if you think back to geometry. It's something you're given. It's a fact. You can't prove it, but we will use it to do other things. So one thing that's going to come up uh, quite a bit tomorrow is I squared. Okay. Well, how would you write I squared without an exponent? Say somebody doesn't understand what a number up high means. How do you write that out the long way? It's I times I. I squared means I times I. But what's I? Square root of negative 1 times itself. Right. So it's kind of like taking the square root of negative 1 and squaring it. Well, what happens when you square and square root? These two things cancel out. And what's left? Negative 1. So when you take i and you square it, the answer you get is negative 1. Okay, we could type that in. Uh, take i, square it, we get negative 1. Okay. 
that's very important to remember for tomorrow. I squared equals negative one. Okay, we'll pick up with that tomorrow. All right, so the homework, um, it's on two separate pages. The first part is with the rectangular and polar. Okay, converting rectangular to polar. Three, page 308, 55 to 65. Okay, all. Make sure you find the polar coordinates of each point. It does, it does not ask you to graph it, so you don't have to graph tonight. And on page 560, uh, 9 to 14, all, that's with complex numbers.